So it is almost uh, 6 o'clock at night. We have not seen one item on the budget. We have not seen one word of the budget. And just remember, six months ago, the Democratic leadership was talking about the most transparent budget process, talked about having the press in the room during negotiation, talked about having cameras in the room during negotiation. Uh, it was said that this is a civics lesson by some of the leaders, that the best we can do is have the open uh, forum for a budget negotiation. And here we are, 6 o'clock at night. The House has indicated they're going to be going in maybe by 8 o'clock, and there isn't one page of one document that any of us have seen. It's simply outrageous, disrespectful, and dishonest to the people of the state of Connecticut, without a doubt. Now remember, we're not just dealing with a budget. We're dealing with several implementers. We're dealing with a, a bond bill. We're dealing with school construction bills. I mean, these are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents. And to Len's point, I mean, you can't have it both ways. You either want transparency or you don't. You can't try and jam stuff down people's throats. I remember when the speaker first took over and he said things are going to be different under my leadership. And they have been to a certain extent. We don't go past midnight very often. And we start on time and those are wonderful things. But this is a budget that I would argue is a budget that will be looked back on as a historic budget for the state of Connecticut. This state is at a crossroads. What happens today or tomorrow is going to change Connecticut for the good or the bad. We should at least be able to know what it is. I mean, we're not Nancy Pelosi. You need to pass something to, to figure out what's in it. We don't ascribe to that. In the Senate, we have a deal that you're not supposed to vote on the budget until there's been 12 hours. You know, we have not seen one budget document. That's a deal between Senator Looney and I have had discussions with them about that issue about uh, 45 minutes ago. But it's just ridiculous that we don't have one page of that document. Are you going to write it for amendment? We're ready to run it when they want it. We've asked them to sign our emergency certification two days ago. Remember when we had the press conference, we said, we'll be ready to run our budget. Will you sign our emergency certification as we stand here today? They have not agreed to sign that emergency certification unrestricted. They're not signing it. So, you know, we can't run something until they run something. But we've asked them to do an emergency certification for our budget. And there has been conversation about that, sir, but there have been conditions uh, discussed to be put on it, and that, that's not fair. I mean, listen, we've said this from the beginning. We have had, now we have our ninth budget since April, and we just want to run it, debate it, and vote on it. To say, okay, well, you can release certification, this bill, but then you can't run amendments on it. Listen, if you don't like it, then vote no, right? I mean, that, that's your prerogative. Everybody in there has the right to vote yes or no on any bill. If you don't like it, vote no. But don't say we can't run amendments on it, or it should be for a certain amount of time. Why do you say this is a historic budget as opposed to a Band-Aid to get Connecticut through the next two years? Because, Mark, I think that what we have gone through in the past seven years, instead of trying to fix the problem, we've made it worse. Instead of trying to look forward in Connecticut, we've moved backward. Their budgets are pessimistic budgets. They are budgets that fix a problem, that attempt to fix a problem for today, tomorrow, and next month. They are not problems that attempt to fix the state of Connecticut. We only fix Connecticut by making these structural changes to Connecticut, because otherwise you're a hamster in a cage. We believe in Connecticut. We believe in the future of Connecticut. We believe Connecticut can move forward in a strong way to be a place where people want to come, to be a place where businesses want to come, to be a place where we don't see headlines like GE is leaving, Aetna is leaving, and Alexion is leaving. We, don't, we won't see those anymore. But we will not get to that point under these types of budgets. That this, vote will, this budget rather will pass and it will go to the governor's desk. Uh, are any of your members going to be involved in this process? 
If you're asking me if any of my members will be voting for the Democrats' budget, the answer is no. And the fact that the speaker says that with pride is sad to me. Glenn, you had an issue, I think it was a couple of years ago, where um, Senator Looney was moving to end debate in the Senate. You had felt at the time you were rushed that year and you weren't given the document in advance. And we know the Senate has some, as they've described them, scheduling challenges this time around. Are you worried you're going to run into another time where we're looking at cutting off debate? And are you going to cut a deal to limit the debate? I'm not cutting a deal that limits the debate. I have offered to Senator Looney that, look, let, if it's going to start in the House, let the House do their business. Let's come in 10 o'clock Friday morning where we do have full attendance. We could get through this relatively quickly, uh, come right in, start at 10 o'clock, start at 930, and we can get done with this budget relatively quickly. It seems foolish if it starts in the House at whatever time and the debate is a reasonable debate in the House, the Senate's not going to vote till 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Now, look, frankly, for me, I'll dig it out. But there are certain members on both sides of the aisle who are of a certain age that I think this is a big wear and tear. There's no reason in the world why we can't do this at 9, 30, 10 o'clock in the morning. Nothing is going to change. What's the rush? If they have the votes, they're going to be there the next morning. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Finally, I'd like to say the false narrative of voting for the Democrat budget or let the draconian measures go in is a false narrative. The real story here is that Representative Claritis is going to put forward in the House our budget. And our budget is the third alternative that they don't want to talk about. But it is the third alternative to the draconian measures. It isn't A and B. It's A, B, and C. That's what has to be thought of. This entire thing to tonight, how does this translate over into the next election cycle? Look, I think people have got to be crazy to elect people who run government this way. You, we have a tax that's on vacation homes that's never seen the light of day. You don't even know what you're affecting, what you're not affecting. They did this in Vermont, and, price, and prices of property dropped. So you, you don't know what you're affecting. I, I question the constitutionality of some of the issues in it, but we don't know what it is. Number two, on April of 2015 or 16, uh, the, gov the uh, AG wrote to Senator Looney and Bob Duff that the tax on the gambling, the um, draft thing, was a violation of the compact. Themis and I have sent a letter to the AG to say, did you get new information? Are you backing off from that? Marty Looney said, if there's a chance it's going to violate the compact, we are not going to do it. Well, what's changed? Debts? Being desperate? Is that what's changed? So, number two, you're taxing cell phone lines, cell phones, I'm not exactly sure, haven't read the language yet. Where was that public hearing? Who got that opportunity to speak up? People buy phones for their kids so they can check on their kids when they leave school, when they're going home or where they're going to be. We're going to tax those as well? We're going to firefighters, EMTs. What does it mean to businesses? Nobody got a right to say one word. And most of us found out about it in the last 36 hours. If you vote these people back in who are putting forth a budget that never saw the light of day, 700 pages guaranteed on this budget, and asking the poor House, we're going to have time while they sit there and suffer. We're going to have at least some time to look at it. They're going to read this on the fly. Where is the fairness? Where is the opportunity to represent this state? Where the people have the right to say what's right and wrong? We, this was supposed to be an open, transparent process, and you're giving us a document and asking them to vote it literally in the same hour they receive it? Are you out of your mind? And you're going to vote these people back into this building and say, do it again, please? What is wrong with you? That's the problem. So the answer is yes, it will affect the 2018 election. Um, you know, I, I made a comment a few weeks back about they've done everything backwards from see back first before the budget and eating the ice cream, call, eating the colon before the ice cream and the whole notion. If you think about the fact that they are taxing people who have a home in Connecticut but are not residents of Connecticut, let's think about who those people are for a second. They are people that have the resources first to have two homes. Okay, they are people that live in another state, for example, Florida, who probably lived in Connecticut to start and moved to Florida, but they're residents of Florida. What do you think those people are going to do now? 
When you, this is what is lost on the Democrats. They, in their sticking their head in the sand mentality of running a state, they choose to believe that people will be okay with that because they have enough money, they have two homes. No, they will sell their home here and get a home somewhere else, or they will come here and rent a home in the summer if that's where they want to be. This is not a common sense approach. It is a stick your head in the sand, let's ignore the reality of what's going on and hope it gets better. We saw how that worked for the past seven years. It gave us a $5 billion deficit and a union concession plan that tied people in this state's hands until 2027. It is not working. Do you think that they would be able to pass this budget if they weren't able to barely run their plan tonight? I mean, if they if they came back, do you think there would be uh, legislators' remorse? I think that it's very simple why they are calling the governor's executive order first as the underlying bill, and then they will amend it with their budget. Because they did not have the budget, the votes, on their budget. And here's what they're doing. Instead of being able to say, we didn't have a deal, we didn't have a budget by October 1st, the governor's draconian cuts are going into place, they want their members to be scared to death of having to vote for the governor's draconian cuts, instead of just letting it happen. Now, I got to tell you, I mean, we're not in the majority at this point, but we don't run our caucuses this way. I want my members to vote for something because they think it's the best for the state of Connecticut, not because they're scared. I want my members to vote for something because they know Connecticut has a bright future and we have a way to move forward. And we believe in that in a positive way, not out of scare tactics and pessimism. And that's what's going on today. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, guys.